All right, so let me let me give you this. Um, um, some some people do this, you know. Um, they'll uh, they'll uh, they'll they'll instead of doing that like I just did it, they'll do one two three four five six seven eight nine ten. You know what? It, no 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 no. Do it slow and drag it out. They'll remember that. Um, so here's what some when you when you talk like this, inevitably somebody's going to say this. Inevitably. Well, well, I know somebody, and they didn't do it that way, and they turned out okay. Well, if we knew the person you're referring to, we might consider that debatable. Well, you know, I turned out okay. Um, we're not going to comment on that. But you need to remember something. You need to remember something. You have been given light and teaching that they did not have. My, my parents, my mom, bless her heart. Wow. We pushed her to the edge of her sanity, and when she tore into us, wow. And it was awful. And it's because she waited till she, you know, we, we literally pushed her off the cliff. And um, um, you know what? Nobody taught my mom this stuff. Nobody we taught her anything. You know, most of our parents, nobody taught them anything. They just sort of did what their parents did, you know? And uh, sometimes that was okay, and sometimes that wasn't okay. Sometimes it was awful. Um, you know, God deals with people differently. Um, he, the angel looks at Mary, and Mary says, How shall I have a child, seeing I know not a man? And the angel explained it to her. When the angel looks at Zacharias and says, you're going to have a child, he said, how can this be? The angel struck him dumb on the spot. Why the difference? Because Zacharias was a priest and he should have known better. He knew God. He knew the law. He knew the priesthood. Mary was just a humble girl. God deals with people differently. Um, uh, well, you know, Pastor... I don't think, just remember, you're not going to improve on God's method. You're, you're not. And um, a guy said this years ago, he said, you can use a different method. Well, a preacher, I'm just going to stand him in the corner. Okay. And you'll get what standing in the corner brings. Um, you will, you can do it a different way, but you will get an inferior result. You can do it any way you want. Nobody's spying on you. But you'll, you'll, you'll remember in the book of Proverbs over and over and over, God spelled it out to where you couldn't miss it. You will remember that. I trust you'll remember that as you try to bypass God's way. I trust you'll remember that. All right. Hebrews 12, 9. So with that in mind, we're going to just jump on a couple side issues that relate to this. And we're, we're trying to be really practical. Okay, I'm just going to say something. I, actually, I'm going to touch on this next week, but I figure I better say something right now. Um, what, I, what I just showed you, okay, so again, common sense, common sense. Um, don't do this in public, okay? 30 years ago, you could have done it. 30 years ago, the guy across the aisle at the store would have helped you, but that was 30 years ago. Or more like 50. Do not do this in public. Do not. And see, here's the mistake people make in our crowd. They'll come in. I'm, I'm aware of the camera. And I'm, I trust I'm out of sight of the camera here. Um, I know this has happened on more than one occasion. Where some gal walks into the church with her baby. And she's got this sticking out of her diaper bag. And she thinks, oh, I'm safe because these are church folks. I know of more than one occasion where somebody in the church turned him into social services. And, and, and your Christian family, they'll be even worse. 
So, you know, you, you don't do this in public. You know, you, you don't do it with your windows open at your house on a summer day. You know, you close the window, you go to a room where there's no sound. You know, you, you know, we live in a day where you must protect yourself. You must be very cautious. So that's just, I just want to say that. All right. More next week on that. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12. Hebrews 12, verse 9. I want you to know the, notice the wording. Boy, the Lord, th this book is so amazing. Every word of God is pure. Every word. Look at verse 9. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days, chasing us after their own pleasure, but he for our own profit. Um, so I want to talk about, you know, Ephesians 6. It says, and ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Um, you know, dad and mom, they've, they've got to be on the same page with this. But, but um, you know, dads, can I, can I say this? Um, you know, mom is, um, mom is, is with the kids, you know, 70, 80 percent of the time. You're gone. You're working. And um, um, there is a temptation and it's a great frustration. So I'm trying to help you ladies out. A uh, great frustration. And that is, you know, dad comes home and he's tired. So he doesn't want to do anything. So, you know, you, you've been trying to do right and you've been trying to discipline the kids and you're wore out, you know, because it, it is quite a battlefront to maintain. You're washing clothes. You're making food. You know, you're you're doing all sorts of stuff. And and, uh, you know, and 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 then on top of it, you're trying to keep track of these little kids and make sure they're obedient. And dad walks in the door and um, uh, dad, it's interesting in the scriptures, God lays the responsibility for this at your feet. Now, mom's got to be with you and mom's there and mom's got to follow through. But dads, um, uh, can I say something to you, dads? Um, most of your, you know, it, whatever, some of you this your past these years, but whether you're past these years or not, don't be always gone. You know, some guys are never home. Like they work all day and then they come home and then they're gone. It's like, is this by design? Is this on purpose that they do this? Um, you know, your, your part in this, you have a big part to play and you say, oh, bless God, I'm tired. I worked all day. Oh, you think she was sitting on the couch eating marshmallows all day? She's tired too, and she's the weaker vessel, and that's why God made you the pillar of strength so that you'd walk in and you'd take over and you'd do your job. And she doesn't have to. I, I've watched it with these with Christian families, you know. Um, once they hear this kind of teaching, then, then they realize, okay, we're supposed to do this, okay? Maybe they didn't know before, but now they know, oh, we're supposed to do this. So they begin to do this. Well, mom, you know, she's with kiddos. She's really working hard at this. And, and dad is not. And wow. You, you talk about something that causes resentment. You know, you know, the husband, he wants to come in. You know, he, he wants the wife to, and, and I'm being facetious, but I'm, but I'm serious. You know, he, he wants her to, honey, you're home. And throw her arm around and give him a big kiss, you know, and it's, everything's wonderful because, you, you know, you just walked in the door. Well, if if she knows that you're going to walk in the door and the three ring circus is going to begin because you're not going to handle the discipline. She's really not looking forward to this battle that you're not going to help take care of. Dad, you need to be conscious of your role. And you need to carry it out and you need to be keenly aware of it. It is just the most bizarre thing. When you think of a softy, in my mind, forgive me, okay? I'm just telling my knee-jerk reaction. I think the woman would be the softy. And yet, you know what? A lot of times that's not the case. A lot of times it's the man that's a softy. Um, uh, men, uh, you, you, God lays this on your shoulders. Um, a woman, I, I've, I've 
heard more than one woman say, you know, in our society, this, this whole thing of the man, you know, and the man being the head and the woman, you know, uh, being in submission, all that. And it's, it's really resented. And yet, yet when it works as God intended it, it's actually a blessing. And, and the women will say how liberating it is when they realize it is the husband who is supposed to bear this responsibility. Yeah, she's following through. But he's going to walk in the door and he's going to do his job. Mama and daddy. Go to 2 Corinthians 4 for a minute. I'm going to try to hurry. You know, I've got a lot I want to say in the next few minutes, and then we're done. Again, my goal in this, my goal in this is um, is I just want to be a blessing and help. That's all I want to be. Um, again, I remember. I remember a lady in a nursery that came to my wife. Wow, what a risky thing. Elizabeth was our baby. Mary hadn't been born yet. And again, Elizabeth, she was what she was. And, and I, I remember this lady came up to my wife and she said, imagine Mitzi was 21 going on 22, first baby. Uh, Elizabeth would have been a year and a half. Elizabeth was, you know, out of control. That was her life story. The first chapter of her biography, out of control. <laughs> and um, a lady in the nursery, an older woman, came up to my wife and she said, Mitzi, she said, do you, do you realize it doesn't have to be this way? She was the first one. She handled it super sweet. She told my wife, she said, you, you need to spank this child. And then God brought a pastor across her path. I'm... I'm not trying to make anybody uncomfortable or make you feel like a fear. That's not what I'm trying to do. But I am trying to get you to see, okay, we've told you what to do. The Bible's told you what to do. I want to, I, I just want you to see what it looks like and how it ought to operate. At least, at least you'll get some idea. You know, you, you'll maybe modify it to suit you a little bit, and that's fine. We're all a little bit different, but God's plan is God's plan. And I just, I'm, I'm just hoping to help you tonight. That's all I want to do. You know, um, Look at 2 Corinthians 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, thank God we've received mercy. Mm -hmm. As we have received mercy, we faint not. But, now watch, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness. Paul said, we have renounced some things. And to renounce is to cast off or reject. It's, it's actually to make a verbal statement. It's like... You know, somebody comes to this place where they say, oh, I'm done with this. I hate this. I don't want to do this anymore. And they verbally just get expressive with it. And they have what they've done is they've renounced it. You remember in the in the Reformation years when uh, uh, many Bible believing Christians were being burned at the stake and persecuted and all that. The the person doing the persecuting would always say, well, let's off the hook if you will renounce your faith. In other words, if you'll say, okay, I'm done. I don't believe this anymore. You know, and, and it was the thought was you were going to really divorce yourself from it. Okay. Um, Paul says one of the things as Christians is um, we need to renounce the hidden things of dishonesty. Um, mama and daddy. Okay. Mama and daddy, you must kiss your negativity. Goodbye. You must kiss your impatience, your spouting of what's on your mind, you must kiss it goodbye. Um, Mama, can I tell you something? Um, your disrespect for your husband and his wishes, you will reap in your children. And, and instantly you're going to give me all your reasons why. And God bless your heart. But I promise you, if you don't respect him, they're not going to respect you. It's just the way it works. More is caught than taught.
Look at Proverbs 31 real quick. I just want you to see a verse or two, Proverbs 31. You know, we have things in our society that are that are killing us as Christians. And the problem is we've just accepted them and we just think they're normal. And um, it's like some of these ideas, you know, about child training. And and, and there again, like what I, what I showed you tonight, um, the average Christian in the average church, they would absolutely have a cow. I will never forget when I taught on this back in good grief. It would have been... Uh, 2002, 2003 at my old church, we had a lady in our church. She was an elderly lady. Bless her heart. She loved us. We loved her. And she had a son. It was a bachelor. And um, he, uh, they came to the church. They were there before we got there. And they were there the whole time we were there. And I taught on this. And one day she looked at her grown son who was in his 40s. And she said, called him my name. She said, should we turn pastor into the police? My kids were small then. See, I'm not worried about it now. But wow, she could have cut my throat. But it was a sincere question. See, see, our society is so jaded. It's lost sight of things that used to be, you know, what I, what I, what I showed you tonight, that used to be normal. The reason we have to show a lot of it now is because it's not normal. It's swung, the pendulum has swung, swung so far the other way. That it just seems, and and my my thank God the guy in our church he looked at his mom and he said, "Mom," he said he's just preaching the Bible. She goes, "Oh, okay," and I'm like, Phew. "Good grief!" George W. Truett was a great preacher in uh, down in Texas in the early 1900s, and in 1917 when World War One was underway. He preached a two-week meeting, and uh, and I've got the transcripts of those meetings, and uh, and his messages were phenomenal. And I was reading through his message one night. He was preaching on how do we know, get to know Jesus better. So he gets two-thirds of the way through the message, and then he launches off talking about his mom. And here's what he said. He said, may I speak a word about my mother now in that glory land these last few years? He said, she was the best Christian I ever saw. He said, can I speak a word about her faith? He said, I was reared in a large family far out on a farm. And my father and my older brothers used to go out in the field. And he said, but me and my little brother were still too little. My, my little brother was four and I was six. And we were too little to get out in the field yet. So we would stay behind. And he said, many are the days I have seen my mother in the morning sobbing. You know, get the picture. Dad and all the older brothers, they go out to the field. So dad's out there. So mom and the six-year-old and the four-year-old, and all of a sudden mom just breaks into sobbing. And he said, uh, you know, I went up to my mom, you know, a little six-year-old, and I said, mom, mother, what, what makes you cry? And she would say, you were too little, my boy, to understand. Never mind. Don't worry about me. And when breakfast was over and all the little things were done, he said, uh, my mother would say, now you stay here. You two boys stay here in the house. And mother is going outside to be alone for a little while. He said she would go away with her face covered in tears. And she would come back a little while later. And every time she came back singing and smiling. And he said the smile on her face was more beautiful than the sunrise. And he said one morning I said to my little brother, as only little boys can do. What do you think happens when mom goes out there? Let's follow her and find out. So they let her get out the door and they watched her get a little ways down and then they snuck out and they followed quietly behind her. And she went out into the orchard. And he said, then we heard her and saw her. She was down on her face before God. He said, I can still remember the intense emotion as she said words like this. She said, Lord Jesus, I can never rear this household of boys like they ought to be raised without your help. I will make shipwreck of them. I cannot guide them. I cannot counsel them. I cannot be the mother or the woman that I ought to be without your help. I will cleave to thee. Teach me and help me every hour. And he said, we heard her and she talked like that a little while. And, um, and then she came back singing every single time. 
He said, when I grow older and manhood was reached, and when I learned what it was to know the Lord Jesus, I knew the secret into which my mother had entered. She was the greatest Christian that I ever saw. It is when you and I tread the path of secret prayer that we find out who Jesus really is. And that's when he opens the door to the secret of his presence. Talked about his mother. You know, she knew she wasn't perfect. She, oh, what a blessing. She knew she was a hopeless mess. Boy, it's a wonderful day when you can look yourself, when I can look myself in the mirror and go, oh, dear God, I'm a mess. But, oh, God, you can help me. That's a wonderful day. It's not about being perfect. It's not about having all your, you know, your eyes dotted. It's falling on your face and saying, oh, God, your standard's way up here, and I'm way down here, but, Lord, I want to be way up there. Oh, God, help me. Oh, he'll answer that prayer. He'll answer that prayer. I have known mothers to repeatedly let their husbands and children know that they resented them. Let me repeat that. I have known mothers. I'm talking about an independent Baptist church is no less. Who behind closed doors. Having renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Who repeatedly let their children know that they resented them and wish they'd never been born. That let their husband know they wish he'd never come around. How they wondered what life would be like without them. What it would be like to be free again and have no burden. To tell them how stupid they are and push them away. The wisest man that ever lived said, every wise woman buildeth her house. But the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. Look at Proverbs 31. Look at verse 25. Strength and honor are her clothing, and she shall rejoice in time to come. Boy, you got to have that long haul in view, guys. Whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're married or you never get married, you know, this whole thing, you got to have the long haul in view. She shall rejoice in time to come. She opened her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue, in her tongue, is the law of kindness, not the law of manipulation. You know, some people, they know how to kindly, softly control things. That's not what he's saying here. In her tongue is the law of kindness. It is a law. In her being somewhere in her lifetime, she made the decision. It would be fixed and rigidly observed that she would be kind as best possible under all circumstances at all times. You know what? Because all of us have a pile of real problems and real dark times. I was walking in the building this morning, this evening, and I don't know what triggered it, but I was thinking about the dark tunnels that come in life. Man, you know, there, there's dark days, but man, sometimes there's dark tunnels. I mean, there's some things you'll, you'll, and some of you that are young, you're, you'll, you'll figure this out someday. You know, someday, you know, life is just a man that is born of a woman is few days and full of trouble. And there's some times in your life where you hit this time and it's just dark for a long time thank god there's you know eventually lord leads you out but you know what if you don't have it in your head that your your tongue is going to be filled with kindness even in the darkness you are going to become one nasty person in jesus name There was a couple in uh, Pickle Lake. They were an, an older couple, and um, he was comical. They were both comical, and um, um, uh, he he was kind of guy. He knew where all the hot spots fishing was. You know, Pickle Lake, way up north, way up north, and he knew where all the best fishing places were. Like he could sneak out of the house at four in the morning. Nobody knew where he went. He never told anybody where the good spots were. People tried to find out, but but there was another. We always suspected did he did he leave it for to get away from her. We often wondered. She was nasty. Oh, they attended the Baptist church there. And when they were at church, you know, she was nice to everybody except him. 
And I'll never forget being at their house. And uh, we were helping them do something, you know, and she said, would you, would you like a cup of coffee? And I said, sure. And her husband goes, I'll take one. She goes, get it yourself. <laughs> um, had he ever stepped out on her? No. Did he make her go to work? No. Did he cuss her out? No. Nope. I don't know what her problem was. But man, the law of kindness was like it was in another world in another country somewhere. And they had separate bedrooms. Oh, my. And Mitzi's, Mitzi's dad was up. Of course, me and Mitzi, we were, you know, early 30s. And Mitzi's dad and mom were, up, were visiting. And, and um, we were telling them about this couple. And, um, and Mitzi said to her dad, she said, Daddy, now, you know, there again, you know, I mean, they're, they're in their 70s. She said, uh, Daddy. He said, is that normal? Mitzi's dad was a real no-nonsense kind of guy, and he loved the Lord, you know, good guy. And Mitzi's dad said, you, you need to listen to what I'm going to say. He said, no, it's not normal, and it's not right. Now, I, I don't have, you know, time or, you know, I, you know, may, there might be some medical condition that arises. I, I realize, but, but I'm just talking about as a general rule, just because somebody decided they were going to have separate bedrooms. Um, I, can I tell you something? You find no hint of that in God's word. It is in the word of God. God intended that you would be sweethearts and lovers for life. Came across the video uh, not too awful long ago. And it was one of these people, you know, that interviews people and she's lost. I mean, she is a rank foul mouth teeth in this, uh, this um, interviewer. And, uh, but she's a young gal. She's about 30, 35. She's just really pretty chick, you know, and she, she, she has her own little TV show and she brings in all these people. And she interviewed this couple in their eighties. They're lost. And she's talking to him and she's trying to get to the secret of they don't know the Lord but they're still in love. Would you look real quick at Song of Solomon, chapter 8? Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. They're in their 80s, and they're still in love, and I, I don't mean they're, they're still serving each other tea, you know, across the table and, and just being cordial. No, they're still in love. You know what that is, don't you? You know, that's how God intended it to be, don't you? You, you understand that? I'm talking about, I realize, you know, lost people, things happen. I get all that. But I'm talking about people in our kind of churches that say they love the Bible and they read the Bible. I tell you what, there's, there's a lot of hooey. There's a lot of Christianity that exists in somebody's imagination because it doesn't produce this. I, I, I just have no use for your Christianity. If somehow you just, you know, you just you, you and your husband are just, you know, and, 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 and I'm, I'm not saying, you know, I understand if he mistreated you, if he stepped out on you, you know, OK, 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 OK. You know, I, you know, we, we could talk about that for a while, too. But, you know, if it's just one of these things where you just sort of got tired of him and or he just got, got tired of her. You know, I, I just don't find that in the Bible, period. Don't, don't tell me how many times you read your Bible through. If you, if you don't still love each other, we got problems. God is love. He that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God. He that loveth not knoweth not God. Oh, we're, we're nice to each other. No, that's not what I said. Do you still love each other you know what that means somehow you've gotten the idea this is just normal it's not supposed to be normal song of solomon 8 verse 7 verse 6 song of solomon 8 you ought to read the book you, you married couples you ought to read the book of song of solomon you ought to read about once every three or four months and just take a gaze at what god intended and say, okay, what can I do? What can I do to keep this going? What can I do? Song Solomon 8, verse 6. 
Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. For love is strong as death. Jealousy is cruel as the grave. The coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath the most vehement flame. Many waters, that's a picture of trouble, cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would utterly be contemned. You know, none of God's promises have an expiration date. You know what? I'm saying this, and I don't mean to be ugly. You know, uh, you know, if, if you don't feel anything towards your, your sweetheart, maybe you need to go see a doctor, okay? Yeah, maybe you need to go see a doctor. But the flame, the affection, the sweetness, it is not meant to die. It is not meant to die. God's promises have no expiration date. Neither do his commands. They're unaffected by 2024. The church has no expiration date. Kindness has no expiration date. Witnessing has no expiration date. Abiding has no expiration date. Living clean has no expiration date. Holy Ghost power and the family and love and marriage. It has no ex expiration date. The only thing that puts a damper on love is sin. That's the only thing. Matthew 24. And we are done. Matthew 24. Boy, it's amazing, isn't it? You see some of these people, you know, they... You know, you know, if you saw them, you know, six months before they got married, you know, they're just they're just crazy. <laughs> you see about each other. And it's like, you know, it's like a most vehement flame, as we just read. And you get about 15, 20 years in and it's really quite chilly. You can give me all your reasons. All I know is it's wrong. That's all I know. No matter what your excuse, it's wrong. You say, what caused that? Matthew 24. Matthew 24. It talked about the signs of the end there. And um, verse 11, it's talking about the time we live in. Matthew 24, 11. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. Now watch. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. What is it? It says, Pastor, it's all his annoying habits. No, nope, afraid not. Afraid not. It's iniquity. You've let something into your life and your heart. And, and the first thing it killed was you and God and that, that vehement flame between you and him. And the next thing it's going to kill is your marriage. I've watched it. I've watched these people. They get out of church and they start drifting. And I think, boy, it's not going to be long, and they're going to be in trouble. So I want you to think about these things tonight. I hope they'll be a help. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth. Bless it, Lord. Please don't let it be misunderstood. Oh, dear God. Wherever you've touched anybody's heart, may they embrace what you have told them. Lord, may they consider. Lord, may they say yes to you with all their heart. God, would you help us here at this church? Lord, that we would just love each other. We'd love our kids. We'd love our families, Lord. And Lord, everybody's at a different stage. And Lord, there's... For many, their life is behind them in, in some ways with all of this. And yet, and yet, Lord. These things are still true. And, and Lord, they affect our relationship with thee. Lord, please don't let the devil heap any false guilt on anyone. God, we pray that you'd help your people, Lord, that wherever you've spoken to them, Lord, they would say, well, tomorrow is a new day. And by your grace, Lord, I'm going to walk with thee. I'm going to do right. I'm going to implement a new law, the law of kindness. I'm going to do what you said with my kids. Now, Lord, we're all a mess. We all are. 
And God, we desperately want your help. We love thee. Lord, with all our hearts, we would please thee. And thank you, Lord. You know our weakness. You know our frailty. And God, we welcome you into our world, our private world, our family world. Lord, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.